Amen again. <laughs> I'm not sure they're awake. <laughs> uh, we would uh, encourage everybody to sign the red folder. If you are a visitor, would you please put your contact information in there so that we can keep you informed about what's going on in our congregation. This Tuesday will be the last Lenten luncheon for the season. Starting at 1145, the speaker is Reverend Joel McMullen from First United Methodist Church. There will be lunch and then message. On Wednesday, we'll have our regular Wednesday night live activities starting at 515 with the meal served. Six will be Bible study and we're studying Philippians. Seven will be choir rehearsal. And there's also Bible study for all age groups at six, you know, youth and children, not just adults studying Philippians. If you would like to purchase an Easter lily, uh, fill out the form that's in your bulletin and put it in the collection plate. A community Easter egg hunt is scheduled for April 1st. And we need candies or small trinkets that can fit in plastic eggs. And those can be dropped off at the office and they need to be dropped off by 10 o'clock on Thursday the 30th. That's this Thursday. Are there other announcements? Yes, um, I'll uh, make a, a couple. One for, for Joseph and the youth. We have um, a, a roughly about 150 um, high school age youth that are going to descend upon um, this church and First Baptist this summer in June for UM Army. And if you don't know what UM Army is, UM Army is a, a group of kids that are high school kids that come out in groups and they go out and work on people's houses who, uh, there he is, um, who need work done, okay? So they might build a wheelchair ramp or, or build a handrail. They might do yard work or repair a fence. Um, they might do some inside work. But um, it's a cool thing for the kids. But these kids need these jobs. So if you know of people whose houses are, are in trouble or whose yards are in trouble, especially people who can't afford to have this stuff done, please tell Joseph, tell the office, give us their address, their name, their phone number if you got it, so that we can uh, have the site people go out and visit them for, for uh, June to do work for these kids. So you got roughly 30 groups of kids that are going to be here from, from Monday to Saturday to go out and work, okay? So there's, that's a lot, of, uh, a lot of kids and a lot of jobs that they need, and this is a great thing for the people and a great thing for the youth. So um, think about that and then let us know uh, of other things that they can do. The other thing I want to mention is um, that, believe it or not, Easter is fast upon us here, okay? Not only is this Tuesday our last, um, did you say he was First United Methodist? He's first, he's first Baptist, but he, we can make him. <laughs> Just be sure and tell him he's a First United Methodist when he's here on Tuesday. But, um, so next week is Palm Sunday, okay? And uh, we're going to have the kids come in. They're going to be waving palm branches, and we're going to combine our services, okay? So we're not going to have an early service next week. Everybody will be here in the late service. Then the following week is Holy Week. So we'll have a, a Maundy Thursday service, and that's not really a service, but I will be here in the sanctuary from 5 to 7 serving communion. Anybody who wants to come, it'll be peaceful and quiet. I'll have some music playing. Um, I will bake the bread, and I'll pour the juice, and I'll serve you communion. And you can spend time praying, uh, kneeling at the altar, um, reflecting on Easter and Holy Week, whatever you want from 5 to 7, that's Thursday. And then on Friday, Good Friday, we'll have a worship service here at 6 p.m., a very cool tenebrae service, um, which I think you're going to really enjoy, but it's also a very cool service to get us into the frame of mind of Easter. And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to have a celebration, of course, for Easter. Again, a combined service. 
um, that's going to be a big day. We have our, our kids from confirmation that will be coming up and joining the church. Uh, there'll be some baptisms, the best day of the year to do all these things. Um, but again, we'll have a combined service, okay? Now, the last thing I want to tell you is that um, there's been a letter sent out to all the membership, okay? If you aren't a member yet or you haven't gotten the letter, ask me or Martha or Sam. Um, we'll get you the letter. But it's a letter on, um, on stewardship. It's a letter, you know, inviting you to send in a pledge to let us know, let the finance committee know what we're going to have dealing with for, for the budget for this year. And on Easter Sunday, we're going to celebrate that with a brunch at 930, a potluck brunch, okay? Um, they told me we haven't had a potluck for like four years here, and I said, what? You know, that's impossible. We can't go. As a Methodist church, we cannot go four years without a potluck, right? <laughs> that's not right. So potluck. I'm going to make a uh, chorizo and egg uh, casserole for you. Chorizo and egg casserole. It's going to be tasty, all right? Um, but you can bring whatever you want to bring, um, at juice, um, milk, donuts, whatever. But we're going to celebrate and have a big potluck brunch together on Easter Sunday, okay? All right. So the pledge cards, we need those in, all right? What else are we forgetting? Anything else? My hubby's back at church. John's here at church. <laughs> and, uh, and let me tell you, not only is John back in church, and I meant to say this last week, and I got distracted and forgot, but uh, Beverly um, was elected or chosen by the East Texas Council of Governments. Now, that's, a, that's 14 counties. That's a big area as their citizen of the year. That is a, uh, to me, I, I think, to, maybe to you too, that's a big honor. That's a really yeah. big honor. Yeah. It's it's very cool. Very cool. All right. Let's stand and greet our family. Thank you. Let's sing, I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. How much Christ loves us, and that's what we're going to be celebrating as we approach Easter. Sing together.
if you would join with me in uh, affirming our beliefs as Christians in this world from the Apostles' Creed number 881 in your bulletin or up on the screen. Let's say this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, please be seated. And uh, let me get to our to our long list of prayers. Um, we have uh, several. Yesterday we had a, a very nice service here in the sanctuary for Kent Gibson. Um, we had a really good crowd here too for that. Um, a lot of people. And we need to keep uh, Jerry and, and all the uh, Gibson family in our prayers. We also need to keep Linda in our prayers. Uh, Linda has her last chemo treatment tomorrow. And then they are off uh, on a two-day drive to Georgia where she will have surgery uh, to remove this breast cancer um, and then r rush back here after a month to go to as a granddaughter, right? Graduation. Yeah, um, graduation. So a lot of prayers for travel, um, prayers for surgery. They promised to keep me updated so I can keep you updated um, on our prayers for them. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right. So prayers for Linda and, uh, J and Jerry, um, lots of different ways. Um, John, does my heart good to see you here. I'm glad you're back with us. Very good. Um, Bill Hedges needs our prayers very much so. Um, please don't forget about Bill. Um, don't forget about uh, Gary and Kathy Thurman who need our prayers. Jerry Busby, uh, Marty sent me a text this morning. He's got a new knee. He's up walking around. Um, their son is with them. She said he doesn't grumble as much about the walking around when her son is <laughs> making him get up and move. So uh, all good there. They're doing well. Um, we have um, some birthdays this week. Linda has a birthday coming up on the 28th, right? two days from now. Linda Farrell. Um, Harriet has a birthday. 59. She's going to be 59 years old on March 30th. Aren't you, Harriet? 103. I don't think it's that many. Um, so uh, some good things going on. Um, Poppy had a birthday. Did you celebrate? Did you celebrate your birthday? Did you get a pony? <laughs> I'm glad you had a good birthday, okay? All right, anything else? Joys or concerns? All right, then, would you pray with me? Almighty God, hear our prayers for all of these um, and others around us for, for this community um, with people hurting all around us. Hear my prayers, O Lord, for this church and for each of those that are hurting here, um, for the unspoken prayers that are all around us. Help us, God, to see you working um, in the midst of all these things and use us, Lord, to be there as your, your church, as your people, when people need us the most and need to see you the most. We bring our prayers and our thanksgivings to you in the holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who taught us when we pray to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We had a little, we had a, we had a flash of Michael W. Smith going through here this morning, right? Let's invite all the kids to come down here in front with David. He's given everybody a hundred dollar bill today. Give or take a hundred. Good morning. How are you? Glad you're back. Good to see you, brother. All right, Poppy, you ready? Here we go. Um, all right, so I've been thinking about a sport that I got to play, and I don't know if you've had a chance to play it. You might get a chance to play it, and if not, it's going to be a total flop. So we're going to give it a shot. I want to talk to you about what they call football in most of the world, but we call it soccer here in the good old U.S. of A. Do we know what we're talking about? You know, the goal of soccer is to score a goal, right? I, I, I'm going to need your help. Do you know soccer? You know the goal of soccer? Okay. You don't play it? Oh, you do play it. I thought you did. Okay, so let me, let me talk to you guys just a second. There are a number of players on the soccer field, okay? There's somebody, Poppy, I'm going to teach you this. There's somebody in the goal that tries to prevent the other team from scoring or kicking a ball or heading a ball into the net, and that person is called the goalie, okay? And then there's uh, people in front of them, okay? I played long ago. We call those folks uh, fullbacks. They're basically trying to help the goalie, right, from letting the opposing team score. And then there's people in the middle. They call halfbacks, and then there's forwards, and the forwards are trying to score going the other direction. Are, are you guys with me so far? Here's the point. There's a lot of people on the field on, on your team, okay? A lot of people. And we're all working for the same goal. And the goal is to prevent the other team from scoring and for our team to try to score more goals than the other team, right? So there's other sports I could have used, hockey. I figured you guys played hockey your whole life, and so I didn't want to go there. I could have gone with football, but I decided not to do that because it's too violent. That's right, that's right. So here's what I want you to know. Sometimes, because these people are running a lot, and I've heard um, somebody say recently who's played a lot of soccer as an adult that sometimes professional soccer players can run as much as seven miles in the course of a game, okay? 
And the game is like 90 minutes, so they have two 45-minute halves. That's exactly right. So here's what I want you to know. Sometimes in the course of running all over the field, sometimes people get tripped. Sometimes it's accidental. Sometimes I think it's just flat people being mean. But a lot of times, because they don't have a lot of padding on, they wear these things right here on their shins called shin guards, but sometimes the shin guards don't protect, and they get hurt. So they'll lay on the ground and just writhe around in pain. Sometimes I think they're just doing it because they're in the midst of running seven miles and they need everybody to take a little bit of a break, including themselves. <laughs> sometimes it's real, right? Sometimes it's real. But you know what I almost ever, almost every time that somebody goes down, you know what I see? Their teammates come to them. And if they are in a position to be able to help them up after they finish their writhing in pain, they will help them up. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, so you're, give me your hand. What's this. So you see what I just did there, right? I helped you up. And why did I do that? Here, I'll help you down now. Why did I do that? Because I didn't want you to have to exert any more energy, right? You were already, in this situation, just listening to me. But if you were on the soccer field and hurting, you were already hurting, right? And it probably made you feel better that I came to help you. Would that, did that make you feel like it was easier for, to get up with my help? Okay, so here's the point. I lifted him up, right? The big thing that we're called to do, which is really not play soccer, is to try to lift each other up, right? Especially when we're hurt and when we're down, okay? So you're, we're going to find out, there, all of us in my little silly little story of soccer, we all need each other to be the best we can be, right? And if one of our team members gets hurt, or worse, if they are mentally not feeling good because they just made a mistake, which we all make, and now they feel bad about themselves, we can go and encourage them and try to lift them up. Maybe by saying it's okay and putting our arm around them or encouraging them, right? So that's the point. We all are called to do our job, but when we don't do our job, what do we want? We want somebody to come and to lift us up and to encourage us, right? So I don't know how you're going to take this sermon and run with it with that, Pastor, but good luck. <laughs> okay, I want you to do me a favor. Do we have candy for the kiddos? It's in the back. Okay, that's very smart and very strategic. If you'll just repeat after me, let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity to participate in team sports. And one of those sports is our family. So I ask you to help us to encourage our family especially when they're not having a good day. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, good job. Poppy, I'm going to help you up. Give me your hand, baby. All right, here we go. And if you guys will follow, she's going to have some candy back there in the back. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, David. Um, our ushers are standing ready, um, and they are going to come forward. And as they do come forward for our offering, um, I would invite you again to pray with me for our gifts and our offerings to God. Father Almighty, we thank you for all that you give to us. And we thank you, Lord, for um, the amazing blessings that you give us with this church and this church family, and this building, and the facilities, and all that we have here, O oh Lord, that we get to take care of, that we get to keep, and that we get to be in. We pray, Lord, that um, you will continue to bless us, and bless us as even we give back to you some of what you have given to us. We pray, God, that these gifts we gather will be multiplied and touched, blessed, just as much um, as the givers are blessed. Help us, O oh Lord, to be the church that you've called us to be. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you so much. I want to introduce once again Beverly Ryan, who's playing um, for us today as uh, Gail is having her, her day off today. Uh, thank you so much, Beverly. That was absolutely uh, just so worshipful. Thank you.
Very nice choir. Beautiful. Okay. This scripture reading today, uh, Romans chapter 12, this is one that uh, we should know. It's the one that everybody should know or, or know about from Paul in Romans, um, starting at verse 1, and it goes like this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent of spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, then give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right? Would you pray with me? Father Almighty, I pray that the words of my lips and the thoughts of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable to you at this time. Amen. All right. Now, if you're listening to all of this from Paul, chapter 12, of Romans, this is a tall order. Hard to do. Hard to do one or two of these things really hard to do all of these things and I believe that's why um, it's where I got the title for this sermon why we have to rise up to new life we do these things with Christ we do these things in Christ's strength not in our own um, now I'm going to start off this by telling you a story and I don't know how this got uh, this escaped the news so much but um, there was a new life form discovered on another planet. And it's a huge humanoid figure, okay? About 200 feet tall, sitting down, breathing. The chest is heaving in and out, breathing, just sitting there. But it doesn't seem to do anything else. And scientists traveled from all over to investigate this strange being. And they became more and more frustrated with the lack of of movement from this creature and finally one of the scientists looked up at the creature and shouted out 
do you think we'll ever understand you? And then the creature suddenly started moving. He rose up, standing on his two enormous feet, and he started to rub his chin. And he said, no. And then he sat back down in the same position he was in. One of the scientists there who figured it out slapped himself in the forehead. And he said, oh, man, of course. It only stands to reason. <laughs> this is hilarious to me. This is <laughs> Don't worry, the early service had pretty much the same reaction to that. <laughs> many, many years ago, when I was pretty young, um, my mom and dad had a, an, an old Dodge pickup that I bought from my dad for $300. And uh, a camper that went, o you know, a cab over camper that, that went on the top of that pickup. And this is now, car seats weren't invented yet. Uh, me and my little brother, um, my, my youngest was a baby, but me and Jimmy, my Florida brother, um, we rode in the top of that cab over camper like little dogs, uh, looking at everything, you know, we could see, running all over the back of that camper. And we went one time camping uh, to Guadalupe Peak, to the, uh, the place with the, the campground there, for the highest peak in Texas. And back then, uh, it wasn't quite the campground that it is now. Back then, it was just a big clearing, dirt clearing, um, because it had been an, there had been an oil well there. And uh, the, the oil people pumped salt water into the ground to make it easier to drill, okay, to get to the oil. And the deer would come out there at night and kick this gravel, this dirt, around to lick the salt. They're still doing it, okay? Now, that's all gone now, but back then, it was the case. So me and my little brother wanted to sleep outside while my mom and dad slept in the camper, and we set these cots out, you know, with our sleeping bags, out there at Guadalupe Peak. Now, this whole area is, is high. It's the highest place in Texas. And... We laid there at night, stars that you could touch, shooting stars one after another, just incredible. We laid out there loving it until we heard something rustling around. And we looked up and we saw a skunk come from under the camper right toward us, right toward the feet of our cots. Now, Jimmy got up and ran towards the woods. I rolled back in my cot, forgetting that, you know, these things have the legs in the middle. I rolled back in my cot thinking, I'm going to get back here. That, my cot flipped up in the air, and I rolled backwards into the dirt. But the skunk it didn't even look at us. He just kept on going. I, I thought for sure we were going to get sprayed. That night, while we're laying there thinking about this skunk and wondering if we're shining our light, see if it's coming back, um, have you ever heard a rabbit scream? We're laying there on our cots at night, and we hear a growl, and then we hear a blood-curdling scream, and we hear another growl, and the scream cuts off instantly. And me and Jimmy thought, <laughs> what is out there and how close is it to us because it sounded way too close and we were terrified on another one of our trips many many years ago um, my oldest daughter was little and she had a friend that lived in horizon city which is out just outside of el paso they both went to this little lutheran school this little girl, African-American girl, they were, they were attached to the, these two kids. We went camping one weekend and invited this little girl to go with us and went and talked to her parents, and they, it was all good. And on the way, we stopped at McDonald's. My middle daughter threw up in the back seat. I should have known then the trip was going to be an adventure. We had a little pop-up camper, and we took this camper up into to Rio Doso, New Mexico, the mountains, on the north side of the mountain to camp out. 
Now, this is a pop-up tent with, you know, canvas. It wasn't insulated at all. And it was kind of cold there. It was in the spring. It was in April. It was kind of cold. In fact, it was so cold that I was afraid we were going to freeze these kids. Um, we took every blanket we had and buried these kids in blankets. Um, the water that we boiled on the stove to wash their faces froze solid overnight. When I got up the next morning, um, I, in fact, I got up a couple of times to turn the burner on inside the pop-up so it'd warm up in there. Um, got up the next morning, it was nine degrees. Freezing cold. Not great camping weather. Um, and that that's so cold where you stand around the fire, it doesn't really do any good, you know? <laughs> Just stand by the fire. One of our trips, many trips with my mom and dad, we went to Yellowstone, and mosquitoes were so bad, so thick, that you could, you know, I mean, it, like a swarm. They were everywhere. You couldn't even go outside. I can remember when the oil pump gave out on that truck, and we sat in Tucson at a Kmart parking lot waiting forever to get that truck fixed. And there have been many, many other misadventures in all of our trips. But if we hadn't taken those trips, I would have never seen the Grand Canyon, which is awe-inspiring. I would have never seen Royal Gorge. It stood on the bridge back then that would sway when the cars went across it. I would have never seen those stars so close you could touch them. I would have never seen the petrified forest. And I would have never camped out on the beach of the Pacific Ocean outside of San Diego listening to the ocean waves at night. When I think about all of those adventures, I have a lot of joy inside, even though we had a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. All those good things. Vince Antonucci has a book, and the book is called I Became a Christian, and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. It's a clever title for this book. In that book, um, he talks about a girl named Emily. Emily's family uh, was going to Disney World, and Emily, for whatever reason, decided to stay home, presumably with an adult, while her parents and all the rest of the family went to Disney World. And when they came back, they brought her one of those shirts that said, my family went to Disney World, my parents went to Disney World, and all I got was this lousy teacher. Emily didn't get to experience the rides. Emily didn't get to experience the sweltering heat of Florida or the unmerciful humidity standing in line for an hour for a five-second ride. Emily didn't get to experience Mickey giving her a hug. She didn't get to experience the drive where the luggage flew off the back of the, the car. And Emily didn't get to experience Space Mountain where her knees are knocking in fear waiting to get onto the ride. Emily didn't get to experience the squeal of delight when she actually experienced the ride. And then getting off and saying she was never really scared at all. Emily missed the whole journey. When Vince wrote this book, he told a story about um, some other people, and I'm going to share that with you in a second. But we said, and I'm quoting him, he said, when I read about the lives of the first Christians in the pages of the New Testament, the very first Christian, he said, I see people who actually went on vacation to Florida and experienced the ups and downs of the trip. And he said, but when I look around at Christians today, I see an awful lot of people, people who just wear the T-shirt, 
for an adventure that they missed out on. And you ask the question, have we missed the journey? Are we stuck in a routine? Are we missing out on the joy and the fear, the laughter, the chaos, the doubt, the mystery, the confusion of following Christ, taking risks for God, and being the body of Christ? For Paul, the goal is to have a body the Christians, a body working in unity as a living and breathing offering to God. One body all together as an offering to God every day. That's our worship. That's our worship. And when Paul says you are the body of Christ, He doesn't mean that we're literally Christ's body in every way, but he means that we are the church, the body that gives a face to Christ in this world, a body that uses its feet to show Christ in this world, a body that uses its hands in this world to show Christ to this world, a voice that speaks to show Christ in this world. And the only way that we can do these things is if we rise to new life. In that book, um, and this is is a a series of people kind of coming together, but in that book... um, there's a story about John Muir. I don't know if you know who John Muir is, but if you're an outdoorsman or a mountain climber, you've heard of John Muir. John Muir, um, in the 1800s, explored every mountain there was in California all the way to Alaska. He was everywhere. The wilderness, and some of them are named after him. He explored every mountain, climbed every mountain. For decades, he went up and down exploring the woods and, and everything outdoors. And at one time in his life, in 1874, he visited a friend of his who had a cabin in the Sierra Mountains by the Yuba River, if you know the area very well there. And it was a cool place, sealed tight cabin that would keep you warm in the winter, build a nice fire in this cabin and keep you toasty even though it's freezing outside. And on that day in December, a storm moved in from the Pacific. And I don't know if you've ever experienced a, a, a storm from the Pacific, but this is the kind of storm where the rain is blowing sideways, you know, and it stings you when it hits you. Really windy, terrible, terrible wind. Where these giant fir trees are leaning because of the wind, right? Powerful storm. The kind of storm that this cabin was built for And in the book, he says, you could easily imagine Muir going into this cabin, tightly sealed and cocked, put another log on the fire, have a nice hot glass of tea, and ride the storm out. But that's not what he did. And his story about John Muir um, made it to Eugene Peterson, the guy that wrote the message. And Eugene Peterson told this story to his kids, and it became one of their all-time favorites. And they would say to Eugene, tell us the story of John Muir again, right? So what John did in this storm was he didn't go into the cabin and hunker down to stay warm. He went out and he climbed up to the highest ridge he could see. And then he climbed up onto the top of one of these trees. And he held on for dear life in the middle of this storm. And he wanted to experience the storm. He wanted to feel the wind lashing at him. He wanted to to hear the wind, take it all in, feel its energy, and experience it. A 
Philip Yancey got a hold of this, and Philip Yancey wrote a book. It's on my shelf. The book is called Church, Why Bother? It's a good one. Philip Yancey is all good. And he said this story became a favorite for the Peterson family, became a kind of an icon for Christian spirituality for their family. A standing rebuke is how he puts it against becoming a mere spectator to life. Moving into the world. Experiencing people. Seeing their chaos. Reaching out to help them. Facing the storm head on. But also experiencing the grandeur the holy, the mystery, the power of a God who's actively involved in this world. The goodness. It's incredible. And this is the vision that Paul has for the church. This is the vision that Paul has for you to go out into the world, to experience the journey to be the body of Christ, to touch people who might be untouchable and to see this amazing God at work all the time. This is the church Paul sees us being. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, help us as your church to experience this wondrous journey, this amazing life. Help us, God, to square ourselves up, turn into the wind, and experience the ride for all that's good and all that's fear. Because that's the only way that we're really going to experience what's out there. Help us, O oh God, to be this church, the church that Paul has in his vision, this body of Christ, willing to reach out to the lowly, willing to overcome evil with good, willing to be kind when kindness is not expected, willing to serve when serving isn't easy, willing to show up when showing up is hard. Help us, O oh God, to be this church so that others along with us, can experience the wonder and the majesty and the glory of what it means to see you in this world. And I ask and pray this for all of us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I don't know um, how many of you... Um, you know, have these adventures or have these journeys, probably a good many of you. I learned a long time ago that you really can't have a trip. No matter how well you plan, tell me if I'm wrong, you plan a vacation, you plan a trip, something is going to go wrong. <laughs> something is going to go wrong. I've, it always does. Life is that way. Being a Christian is that way. It's not all roses. It's not all easy. But when we embrace that journey and that challenge, that's when we see God at God's greatest. And that's what Paul has in mind for us to be this church, to be like that, to jump in, get on the ride, jump into the chaos 
be terrified at one hand and exhilarated on the other. So my invitation for you this morning is to be the church that Paul has in mind. Be this church. I'll invite you to pray, to ask God to help you, to show you, to lead you and guide you in this life as we sing a hymn that I think is very appropriate for this passage of Scripture. Have thine own way, Lord. Let's all stand and sing. If it makes you feel any better, when I had jumped into this journey, I was terrified. But I wouldn't trade it for the world because I have seen the greatness of God so many times. And the greatness of God is waiting for you outside, waiting for you everywhere you will be. Guided by the Spirit, you will see miraculous and wondrous things. Rejoice in this and go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.